Velvet Remedy and I trotted back down the red row. Steel hooves floating alongside beside me. Our weapons and supplies floated behind. I winced, holding a hoof to my chest. Velvet Remedy had done the best she could for me with her magic, rebuilding the rib I had lost. But it hurt like hell, and I was still having trouble breathing. The damage had weakened me, and it would take time and potions before I could regain my endurance. I had planned to ascend, Red Eye had told me. Some pony will have to take up the tasks that the princesses and Pegasi left to run wild, after all. Some pony will have to regulate the weather to raise the sun and the moon. Weather control. I knew how he intended to pull that off, just as I knew how he was intending to become a god capable of doing Celestia Luna's task. And I realized that he would be able to move the sun and the moon too, since neither of them stood in the way to. As Princess Luna had told Midnight Shower, Trump his efforts. I wasn't sure on the details, but by how I had learned enough to know that Red Eye had a plan, even if I couldn't see. That Cyber Pony knew exactly what he was doing. After hacking the Ministry of Awesome's terminal, I had been able to review the specifics of the single Pegasus project. Unfortunately, without my pit buck, I had no way of copying any information or schematics. It occurred to me that I may have a need to have the memory recorded so I can review it later. What I did not know, what I didn't learn until a lot later, was that accessing that terminal had set off alarms someplace far away, and that the war was coming. Several things were clear. The single Pegasus project was indeed designed for equestria-wide weather control. The center hub for the SPP was located above the clouds and had some of the most fearsome defenses I had ever imagined, including a shield that put the one in the Ministry of Awesome to shame. There was a bypass spell on the shield, but I had no idea who it was designed to allow through. My guess was Rainbow Dash. The suspended animation pod from which the entire single Pegasus project was supposed to be run was unoccupied, and it had never been activated. A dull rumble shook the Ministry of Awesome. The lights above swayed, dust showered down, and poorly stacked boxes thudded to the floor throughout the building. We looked up, shocked from my retrieve. I returned to Velvet Remedy as another tremor vibrated the floor. We trotted faster, my chest beginning to ache badly as we picked the pace. We flung the doors open. We were greeted by choking, thick pink, and flames. My lungs collapsed, and I fell to the ground, my magic imploding, dropping steel hooves. I felt myself dying, the pink cloud tearing me apart like I was filled with Philadelphia Paris brights. Velvet Remedy collapsed next to me with a weak cry. The basement of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences had exploded. The suffering Olicorn had finally lost her battle, or perhaps the clinking chains had let off a spark. The whole Ministry was on fire as were the dead trees, all of them, including the ones that formed the Ministry of Peace. I could hear the building groaning as it began to buckle. The basement had been huge, stretching under a third of Ministry Walk, and when it blew, the explosion breached the tunnel between the Royal Treasury and Princess Celestia's school for gifted unicorns. The remains of the field were filling with an instantly lethal concentration of pink cloud setting off the gala fireworks and turning the mother dragon into a mouse had not made all that cloud magically disappear. It was more diffused here, but that just meant we had more seconds to live. Maybe a full minute, at most, of that without consciousness. My vision blurred and darkened. I felt pyrolite thump down limply on my back. I barely saw the shadow of the sky bandit dropping out of the air above us. Velvet Remedy shoved all three of our super restoration potions she saw, or she was still carrying, into my muzzle, making me drink, then fell into unconsciousness. I felt my body jolt alive as the overdose of healing magic flooded through me. 
I was alive to the point I was burning up. My nerves were on fire, but I was conscious. And that was enough to levitate every pony and everything around me. I tossed a stall onto the Sky Bandit, shouting for Calamity to fly as fast as he could. Already, I was beginning to weaken, the cloud clawing at me. The plain cloud was hurting Calamity too, and fast was not fast at all. I could hear him grunt, straining to keep us aloft, whining with the effort. I pulled open Velvet Remedy's medical boxes. We were out of Super Restoration potions, but maybe she still had healing potions left? Nothing. I closed it, and crawled around to her other side, before I could open the box. Clemity fell unconscious, and the Sky Bandit began to fall. I tried to focus. My brain felt like it was being beaten with a sledgehammer. I screamed with the effort. My lungs were hot coals in my breast. Tapping into my reserves, I shouldn't have had any more. Be strong. Be unwavering. Be awesome. I enveloped us with my magic, my horn flaring with an overglow. The strain was excruciating. The sky bandit drifted upwards until it splashed into the river, heavily ribboned with pink, which formed a moat around the front of Canterlot. I was tossed forward, falling on top of Velvet Remedy. The sky bandit seemed willing to float. The magic that allowed Calamity to pull it through the air, with all of us inside, apparently making it buoyant. Or, maybe the goddesses were again showing us mercy. Either way, I released my magic, falling weakly to the passenger wagon floor. I pressed a hoof against Velvet Remedy's neck, and checked Pyrolite's breathing. They were both unconscious, but alive. I prayed neither of them were in a coma. The passenger wagon began to turn lazily in the floating river. My ears perked up as they caught the roar of a waterfall. Oh... Oh no. So much for the mercy of the goddesses. I didn't even waste the energy of getting back to my hooves. I threw my magic around the sky bandit and prayed. The passenger wagon reached the edge and began to tip. My horn flared again, enveloping by another overglow as I struggled to keep us from somersaulting. The water continued to shove us over the outcrop. We burst through the pink cloud. We were falling. I pushed us forward, as far from the falling water as I could while we fell, keeping us from flipping, and slowed our fall, but I didn't have the strength to stop our fall completely, or even really guide us. Canterlot was a long way up the side of the mountain. Velvet Remnant was thrown from the passenger wagon when the Sky Bandit hit the Zebra Town aqueduct with a jarring thud. It was almost wide enough for the passenger wagon to slide down broadside. Her body landed in the aqueduct and was swept away in the rushing water. Whoa, Nelly! Calamity jerked, uh, conscious, flapping his wings as hard as he could. I dodged Steelhoof's sliding body and jumped out after Velvet as Calamity struggled to get the passenger wagon under control. I heard a peeling metallic scream behind me as the Sky Bandit scraped against the walls of the aqueduct, Calamity trying to pull up. Ahead of me, I saw Velvet's body. I lashed out with my telekinesis. Water splashed into my muzzle. I wheezed, fire igniting in my lungs again, worse than before. My magic faltered on the edge of burnout. I focused harder, kicking with all four legs, as I battled to keep my head above the water while concentrating on Velvet Remedy. I had to get us out of the water before she drowned. I cast out my magic again, and this time I caught her. Lifting her up out of the water, even as we both rushed down the aqueduct. I began to draw her closer, reeling her in. Now I was merely struggling to keep from being pulled under. It was a losing battle. I was not even an adequate swimmer. My head went under and my lungs took in water. I broke the surface again, coughing violently. My magic had imploded and Velvet had fallen back into the water, two pony lengths in front of me. One of the collapsed sections of the aqueduct loomed just ahead. I kicked this time propelling myself forward. I reached out, hooking my foreleg around Velvet's, trying to grab hold of her, wishing I had talons rather than hooves. I got my other foreleg around her neck. We twisted about in the river, rushing towards the edge, as I tried to keep either of us from drowning. I fought to wrap us in magic, but I was too overstressed and exhausted. The spell wouldn't manifest. We washed over the side, plummeting 
towards the broken blocks of the aqueduct below. Calamity caught us, and promptly splash landed at the edge of the lake which had formed beneath the broken aqueduct. Velvet Remedy and I flew out of his forelegs and hit mud, sliding to a stop. I struggled to get up, to crawl over to her and make sure that she was still breathing. I would have settled for squirming through the mud if, I got, if it got me closer, but my body wouldn't respond at all. It had quit. Too much trauma, too much stress, in too short a period of time. Enough. The Diamond Orb The wash from the landing Griffin Chaser 4 tugged at my hood and flapped my cloak behind me. I watched as Rarity stepped off the flying machine, her head bundled in a fashionable scarf to protect her mane from the wind. She trotted towards me as the pony pedaled whirligig lifted back into the brilliant blue sky. I basked in the light and warmth of the midday sun, such a rare and precious gift, as my host watched the beautiful white unicorn approach. There you are, she smiled, as if my host had been lost. Is everything ready? Yes, Miss Rarity, my host said in a naturally husky voice. May I ask, who will be the victim of this spell? Rarity cocked her head, looking at my host oddly. Why, me, of course. I felt my host's jaw drop. I wouldn't dream of doing something like that to any other pony. Uh, of course, my host said, clearly taken aback. Then, if I may ask, how many? The Griffin Chaser 4 was now flying uh, far enough away that the wind had died down. The squeaking sound of the machine had faded into the distance. Rarity motioned with a hoof for my host to follow. Walking towards a set of glass doors on a quaintly nondescripted building, my host galloped forward and tipped his head. I felt the casual flow of magic as he opened the door for the Ministry Mayor. Why, thank you, she beamed at him. Such manners. Rarity gave my host a kiss on the horn. He turned and followed her inside, watching reverently. She was gorgeous, sexy, in a way that transcended her age regal, and my host was male. Yet, the only stirring was in his heart. He was a perfect gentle stallion, and not just an appearance. I found he was a male. I didn't mind having my host in the slightest. And I felt ashamed, remembering what I had done weeks ago while sick in Steelhoof's shack. My host was a better pony than I. Forty-two, Rarity announced. My host stopped dead, his heart skipping a beat, and not in a good way. His muzzle gaped, his eyes widened in shock, if not outright horror. F -f forty-two? My own mind was reeling. Well, actually forty-three, she said whimsically. I do wish to keep a small part for myself. You... My host just stood there, shaking. You want me to cut your soul into forty-two pieces? He said weakly. I mean, forty-three? Yes, she nodded primly. Rarity smiled, walking up to my host and putting a hoof on his shoulder. Don't worry, I know you can do this. I, I, my host blinked. I'm always telling ponies that my top magician is the absolute master when it comes to magic and cutting things, she said encouragingly. And that, Snips, is you. My host, Snips, swallowed nervously and nodded. Now, is the chamber ready? You've had enough time with the black book? Snips nodded again. But, Mistress Rarity, 43? I can't be sure you'll survive, or what you'll be like afterwards. Rarity's smile faltered revealing a deep sadness behind her mask. I'll survive. We all will. She put her warm, confident demeanor back on. Now, I've sent Snails the soul jars. He'll be doing the guidance, so you don't have to worry about that. From what I've read, the shards will seek out the vessels themselves, 
so it's practically idiot-proof. She patted me on the shoulder. Just worry about the cutting. Shards of your soul, my host said softly. Pieces. A lot of pieces. Began to fall into place. Yes, Rarity said, and took a deep breath. Now, I'll be right down. I need to freshen up a bit. She began to trot off, then turned and looked beseechingly at my host. A pretense of being happy or worry-free had evaporated. She looked scared. Snips? Will it hurt? Her voice was almost like that of a filly. Snips swallowed hard, frowned, and admitted. Miss Rarity, it will probably redefine torture. Rarity gave a little shake and strangled back a soft whimper, then pulled herself together, lifting her head high. Well, at least it will be quick. She disappeared down the hall. My host watched her go until the shadows of the hallway enveloped her. And then he turned, using his magic to push a block high in the wall. A grating sound filled the hallways as stone slid into place, revealing a hidden stairwell that descended into blackness. Minutes later, my host was standing in a darkened ritual chamber. The only light was from the few glowing gemstones set within strange glyphs that shimmered with crimson liquid and a single candle. The candle illuminated a stand upon which the black book rested. The air in the room was exceedingly chilly. I could see my host's breath. Forty-three snails, my host moaned. Rarity wants me to cut her soul into forty-three pieces. I... I don't know if I can do it. Forty-three? The other taller robed unicorn asked slowly. But there's only forty-two soul jars. I counted. Twice. Just in case I messed up the first time. Yeah. She says she wants to keep them for herself. What? Is she giving the rest away as gifts or something? Snips shook his head. I don't know. He looked up. Hey, Snails, are you okay? Yeah, said the other unicorn slowly. I just hope I won't mess anything up. I felt Snips sigh. Hey, you won't mess it up. Miss Rarity wouldn't entrust something as big as this to ponies she thought would mess it up. He gave Snails an encouraging smile. Remember what Rarity always says about you. That I'm tall? No, the other thing. Snips urged. That I may be slow, but I always get there, eventually, Snail said, his voice building in confidence. And that's better than she can say about most ponies. That's right, Snips clapped. Now, go to the soul jars and be ready. This, this is really going to happen. Well, we always managed, or wanted to see awesome magic, Snails reminisced. And this is the most awesomest. Yeah, Snips said, sounding a little nervous again. The room was dark and cold and still. The light of the candle flickered as the candle slowly burnt down. It felt like forever before Rarity came down the stairs. And when she did, she was wrapped in a black hooded robe, like she was attending her own funeral. Without a word, she walked to the center of this chamber, standing in the mist of all the slowly glowing gems. Snips turned to her, levitating the black book in front of him. Carefully, he read the alien words. Words from a long dead zebra tongue, born of madness, or possibly born of the stars. I felt my host concentrate, pouring all of his focus into the spell. I felt power wash over me, not only from within, but from without. Power drawn by strange, black pieces, places. The magic was vile and repulsive. I felt violated. Rarity lifted from the floor, began to float up towards a small magical vortex pooling beneath her. The vortex of Eltridge energy rose up and began to wrap itself around the unicorn mare, curling around her like a cocoon or a constricting snake. Her expression was one of mounting worry, 
edging swiftly towards panic, but never getting there. Instead, the screaming began. I wanted to pull out of the memory orb. I couldn't bear to hear those screams. Not just the pain of the nightmarish mental anguish. I remembered the hellish ride in the autonomous healing booth. What the spell was doing to rarity was orders of magnitudes worse. The black magic washed over Snips, pooling at the tip of his horn, then taking flight. A sphere of pure void, blacker than absolute darkness, took flight from our horn and collided with the eldritch energies spinning about rarity. There was an explosion as darkness turned to light and the eldritch energies transformed into a prismatic legion of shattered lights, streaking over Snip's head, leaving bright plasma trails behind them as they loomed and honed in on their receptacles. Snip's never turned to watch. He never even looked at the soul jars. The unicorn buck only had eyes for rarity, and he dashed to catch her as she fell, unconscious, to the floor. But then, he didn't have to. I already knew what they were. How far would you go for your friends? How much would you give up for them? With all I had seen of rarity, I knew her deepest fear and greatest pain was losing her friends, seeing them drift apart, fracturing. Oh no, I'm fine. It's just, sometimes it feels like we're pulling apart, and all I can do, and I can't stand to see that happen, I really must do something about it. What did I know of soul jars? I knew they were virtually indestructible, eternal. I knew that you could hang other spells on them, allowing those spells to last effectively forever. But if you touched it, or focused your magic on it, then a spell took a picture of your soul. I remember being Spike as Rarity led her friends down the hallway to see Rainbow Dash's new armor. I recalled the strange carpet we had walked across, and the sudden chill when Spike had stepped on it. Twilight Sparkle had reacted to it as well. Of course she had. Twilight had felt that particular chill before, from Rarity's mirror. I even suspected she was about to call Rarity on it when Rarity distracted her with Rainbow Dash. Then a second enchantment will allow the mirror to show that image, a reflection of the soul, of who you truly were deep inside. A picture is only a picture, but a picture with that spell placed upon it would be more than just an image of the pony. It would radiate with an aura of her true soul. And Twilight? Pinkie Pie had asked in that final message, the one Twilight Sparkle had never received. Do you think, maybe, you could go with me? I'm kinda scared. And it isn't the sort of scared that goes away with a giggle. I mean, I have you with me now. So you'll kinda be with me anyway. I should be there for her. Like she's with me. Some pony should be there. Scootaloo had said, coughing violently. Just want Dash to know. We didn't all... She's not alone. 42. Only 42 were ever made. Watcher, Spike, had told me. Seven sets of six. One for each of the Ministry Mares, and one for Princess Luna. Concentrating. I opened my saddlebags and floated out Rarity's soul jars, setting them before me, all together. They were stronger that way. Be strong. Be pleasant. Be unwavering. Be smart. Be awesome. Awareness. It was under E. Footnote. Maximum level. Quest perk added. My Little Ponies. You have collected one of each of the six Ministry Mayor's statuettes. Stronger together than they were apart, they have granted you plus one luck in addition to their normal benefits.